A little one. Oh, it's almost a keeper. That's a that's a breakfast size bass, huh? Every day you spin up this river, up in the Delta, the good Lord don't count that day against you. I believe that, sure enough. My mind's absolutely at ease when I'm up here. So naturally, the less worries you got, the longer you're gonna live. Ain't that right? This beautiful spot, I tell you what. Hard to imagine you only, how far, Burnley? What's that? 20 minutes, 30 minutes from yeah, Mobile? 20. I had a good friend who fished with me and hunted with me when we were growing up, just like two boys, I guess. But um, I grew up fishing and fishing in those little freshwater swamp places and lakes, the dead lakes up there. We really have here a national treasure in the fact that we have some of the most beautiful um, land that you've ever seen, beautiful water systems that you've ever seen. We've got so much here that's, that we can all enjoy forever. The Mobile Tensaw Delta lies at the head of Mobile Bay, northeast of the city of Mobile. It is some 40 miles long and 10 miles wide. With five major rivers flowing into it, the Delta is the second largest drainage basin within the United States. 20% of all the nation's fresh water flows through its quarter million acres of swamps, marshes, and bottomland hardwood forests. With its rich organic matter and soils extending to depths of 70 feet, the delta filters and purifies the water flowing through it and acts as a buffer by storing floodwaters like a giant sponge. It is valuable habitat for 250 species of birds, 234 species of fish, and 37 species of endangered plants and animals. Ever since prehistoric time, people have depended on the Delta's rich resources. Between 95 and 98 percent of our commercial seafood depend on the estuary for part, at least part of their life cycle the delta provides the basis for the food web. And so many of these both invertebrate and vertebrate species that we depend on for our multi-million dollar seafood industry uh, basically start out in one way or another with the delta. These shrimp are shipped all over the world. Mobile Bay white shrimp is one of the better known varieties there is and very high demand, excellent quality. We're going to ease up in here and look, see if we can't find some of the nursery ground of the shrimp. Shrimp, of course, is the backbone of the, of the whole commercial industry. It's these estuaries like this right here that, where the shrimp come in their larva stage to, to mature before they return to the Gulf, the open waters where the commercially are, where they're harvested. That's a nice medium-sized shrimp hiding in the grass here, trying to keep away from all the specks and reds that lead him up. For years, the, even the commercial industry kind of took this area for granted. We just went out when, when shrimp season opened, when they got large enough to catch and started catching our shrimp. And we just assumed it would always be that way. But we've come to realize ourselves that, that uh, the habitat is so crucial to our industry. Water makes the difference. It makes our economic base a little bit different. It makes our culture a little bit different. It is the difference. Call the crab, Charlotte. These estuaries, this bay, these rivers, these streams, this sets us aside from other places in the United States. 
How far is the Tom Bigby straight across here? Now? Oh, 10 miles. 10 miles, and mm -hmm. about 35 miles they'll yeah. come together, and that's what we think of as the beginning of the delta. This would be the upper reaches and just uh, tremendously fertile land, and that's why the hardwoods here. <laughs> Forestry in Alabama is the number one manufacturing industry in the state. In the Fourth County area here, last year or the year before, contributed $650 million to the area economy. For every dollar that this landowner is getting paid for his timber, uh, 12 more dollars accrue to the economy. That is, the folks that are sawing the timber down, manufacturing the lumber, selling the lumber. And so uh, trees have a multiplier effect of 12. About 13,000 people, I believe, in the four county areas on the lower river system here depend on forest products for their employment. Without the delta, you don't have your shrimping, you don't have your crabbing, you don't have your restaurants, you don't have your uh, commercial fishing, you don't have your sport fishing. Everything starts right here in the delta. I'm from Atlanta and moved down here five years ago. I tell you, these guys really are spoiled in Mobile. Uh, within 60 miles, you can see a black bear or a, a cougar or wild pigs and deer north of here. And 60 miles south, you can catch a blue marlin. I mean, it's, it's beautiful what they've got going for it down here. Ducks, uh, speckled trout, red snappers, just unbelievable. Not too many places you can come out and enjoy a sport like this. You know? I fish the Delta. I fish all the rivers. And uh, every chance I get, uh, I have to work every now and then to tackle shop. But I was, uh, like today, I went to Mobile. But the main reason for it, I wanted to check, see how the water looked on the causeway. That's a nice fishing guy. Yep. Yeah. It's a dream come true if it'll only remain the same. I've lived in Mobile all my life, and I had the impression of the Delta being seen from the highways and the bridges, et cetera. It's massive, it's expansive, and you don't usually see much of anything other than the natural. But you go up into the Delta and you putz around in a small boat or something, and it becomes a little overwhelming the types of activities that are going on and have been going on over time and that cumulatively, little by little, are eating into the Delta. It is not a vast, pristine, undisturbed environment. It has been being utilized. It has been being used up. And that really has come home to me recently, that uh, it's not as durable and is not as, as large a resource as I thought it was. It just seems that we are nickel and diming the, the resource to death and small parceling this out of existence and small parceling that out of existence without any foresight as to the, the cumulative consequences of what we're doing. Talk about money and water, money and water. I think Mobile will, before the turn of the century, be the largest city in the state of Alabama. Money and water. I think we are bound to have uh, good growth with the Tennessee Tom Bigby waterway opening with the uh, discovery of gas and oil in the bay and all the other things we have going for us. Uh, we're bound to have uh, considerable growth. Money and water can both be found Seeking that lowest common ground People on every side of town Drinking those liquid assets down Mobile's coming back, you can see in here, and just about uh, every block has got something going on right now in terms of rebuilding and renovation and so forth. I think there's a lot of it, a very large amount of expectation that there will be a large amount of growth as a result of the Tim Tom. We're counting on it. I think they need a plan for, you know, on, on the big scale, um, 
they need to be optimistic that Mobile is really going to get big. The long range plans of like, what is the cumulative effect of all this? I don't think anyone's really sat down and put the pencil to it. Uh, it's a little hodgepodge of something here. They permit this activity, they permit the next activity here. And then the cumulative effect is no one's ever added all these things up. This actually just see what the ultimate effect is. And I think someone needs to do some studying on this. Who? I don't know. That's the thing. There's no one really in charge. Uh, it's just a bunch of agencies that are permitting this and okaying this or denying this action and this and that. And I don't think that anyone as a planning committee has ever sat down and looked at the, the entire scope of the matter. If the problem isn't a crisis, very few people see it as a problem. And until it becomes a crisis and you're acting uh, when it's past due, then no one is really concerned. Could this growth have an impact on Delta wetlands? Uh, I don't really know much about that. <laughs> I really don't know. I don't have many thoughts on that subject. I don't know that much about the, all that stuff. I really don't know that much about it, though, I'll tell you the truth. I'm not that well informed about it. The government now controls that, and I, I hope they do. But, you know, I, you gotta, so I guess you'd have to see what you want more in the uh, economy or the environment. Traditionally, many people have felt that uh, you either have to choose between growth and development on the one hand or environmental quality on the other. They feel that the two are mutually exclusive. I think they're interdependent. I think one depends upon the other. If in the uh, quest for jobs and incomes, we pollute this bay, fill in these wetlands, drain these marshes, and degradate the quality of life here that we so depend on in the Mobile area, we're going to be in big trouble. We're not going to be what I would call very prosperous. They have destroyed that bay, that uh, polecat bay. That was one of the prettiest bays we had. Look on your map. Uh -huh. Can you find Polecat Bay? Is it on there? Yeah. The north half of it is completely destroyed from the old aluminum ore and the Corps of Engineers filled up. In my experience in this country, I don't think there is a system that is experiencing both the diversity and the intensity of resource demand that this bay estuarine ecosystem is. A natural ecosystem with physical and chemical and biological and geological components that absorbs a tremendous amount of strain. You might draw the analogy to the earthquake situation on the west coast. And it is capable of, of absorbing a tremendous amount of this, this stress and then collapses essentially without warning. Since 1943, nearly 25,000 acres of delta and bay bottom have been lost to dredging and filling. Delta marshland has been reduced by 50% with the destruction of almost 10,000 acres. That's half of the delta marshland gone. Within two years, permit applications have been made to dredge or fill another 1,380 acres. In addition, at least 130 million gallons of processed wastewater is discharged into the delta every day. At this rate of utilization, experts fear the collapse of the entire delta ecosystem within our lifetime. It often takes the, just about the complete loss of an area before people become concerned enough and, and vocal enough and active enough to try to save just the few remaining acres that, that exist in their natural state. It's a shame that it has to go that far before people realize what they have and what they have lost. There's less fish and less birds and less of all kind of wildlife than there used to be because there's less habitat. Uh, you know, we just don't ha simply have the marsh area that we used to have. If this, what we have left here, if it's destroyed, then there, there's no, not going to be any fish here. But not only that, there's not going to be any fish in the Gulf for the charter captains in the summertime to catch because those fish show up simply to feed off the fish that are you know, raising the estuary areas. 
we're talking about these resources that are based on land, on estuary areas, that are owned by people and by companies. It may be fine right now that, you know, all these people are, are not going to develop our delta and it's going to continue as it is. But one day they, those hands may change and the new people may feel different. And so, you know, the whole use may change. And the problem is when they do something up there, 20 miles north of here to a marsh, it affects what's happening here. And not only here, it affects 30 miles down the coast and even in the Gulf. If we want to continue to have this, all these natural, this natural beauty and natural resource continue, we've got to do something to preserve that land up there that's pretty much the base of all of it. 20 minutes from the, the Mobile Causeway, you look off to the east and you see nothing but marsh and trees. It's just like it would look if you were a thousand miles into the marsh somewhere in the wilderness. It's tough to put a value on how much it's worth in dollars and cents to come out here and take your son to catch his first redfish. <laughs> I'm a laid back user. I don't, I don't catch many fish, but I just come up here and, and uh, drink the beer and uh, <laughs> goof off. I let my leader here uh, take me to the duck blind and fix it up and make me do some work. What kind of fish is that? Uh, Redfish, baby. Supper ready? It's a way to uh, get your peace of mind back from uh, running around the city and uh, doing what you have to do every day of your life to survive. The wood ducks decoy that well. They kind of just know where they want to be and yeah. just sort of drop in there. Finally, usually helps them along with a couple hundred pounds of corn. <laughs> <laughs> they come again. Woody. Good shot, buddy boy. Then I'm through. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do any better than that. Y'all shoot. Okay, now we've given him all the shots. <laughs> you ready to get serious? And we saw pintails and we saw gadwalls and teal everywhere. I get emotional about it because it's something that you can't do. Ever. And this is home. And that means something. Only a sick bird fouls its nest. This is our nest. And we're not meaning to foul it. But if we don't take care of it, set it aside and protect it, it will be foul piecemeal. Not by any